Hello, and welcome back to The Give and Go. I'm your co-host, Reynoso, here with my boy, Soltero. What's up, guys? We've got a loaded docket today, man. There's so much that happened. We can talk about Atleti getting a major win against Real Sociedad. Big win. We can talk about Jude Bellingham's brace once again, 10 goals in La Liga. AC Milan, Olivier Giroud getting into goal and playing goalkeeper for 10 full minutes. Pulisic scoring a goal, assisted by Yunus Musa. We can talk about Inter Miami getting kicked out of MLS playoff contention. So much happened this weekend, and I'm excited to just kind of, you know, get snapshots of all that happened in world football. So, to start off today's show, tell me, bro, where do you want to go? I want to start off with Atletico, bro. This show is essentially going to be an Atletico update on a weekly basis as long as we keep winning and as long as we keep just showing out at the Metropolitano. I'm going to keep just giving Atletico updates like it's nobody's business, bro. (laughs) Because we got a really good win at home. It seems like all of our games are at home recently, by the way. We're going to have a hellish second half of the season where we just go on like five, six games out on the road. That's going to suck. But right now, I'm really enjoying these home games. And we hosted Real Sociedad going into this game man i was actually kind of nervy Sociedad that have been on a really good streak as of late playing very offensive football scoring a lot of goals and you know atletico has been good themselves we've been on a really good streak on our own so this ended up being two teams going at each other who are trying to get closer and closer to the top of the la liga table and i'm just gonna go ahead and say it outright atletico once again gets a weird but lucky result here we win 2-1 ultimately getting a penalty late into the match. Antoine Griezmann puts it home, but we end up getting those very valuable three points, and Sociedad lose out, and in my opinion, in a pretty unlucky fashion. I do think it was a handball if you haven't seen it. Player was basically on the ground. A drilled shot from Griezmann ends up hitting his arm. It it is a handball, but my God, is it just pure bad luck for Sociedad. Nothing the defender could have done, but I mean, hey, I'm going to take it every day of the week. Uh, But there's one player that I really want to highlight in this performance specifically, and I oddly enough have not highlighted him beforehand until now, even though he's been playing great all season, and it is our left wing back Samuelino, man. Perfect. Dude, it gets his first goal in an Atleti jersey, and he has been so deserving of it crafting so many chances in all of our previous games and in this time he gets a beautiful ball from Koke right over the top perfect first touch to put him in an advanced position going straight to the box going right at the heart of the Sociedad defense and then he put and then he drills it home with his left foot takes it past the keeper it's one nil in that moment but dude Samuel Lino bro like he's been an absolute revelation for us he is the apparent heir to that left back position that has really hasn't been filled since Felipe Luis left yeah, bro yeah. and I really thought that Renan Lodi was going to be that guy and I gave him chance after chance after chance, bro, for him to actually be our left back or our left wing back to where he could bomb up and down that left side, send in really good crosses, create a lot of chances, but also be very effective defensively. But Lodi couldn't do it. He really couldn't. At the end of the day, he was sloppy offensively, really bad crossing. And and just in my opinion, he always made the wrong decisions. Whether it was offensively or defensively, for me, he just ended up being a pretty average left back. And so we get this guy Samuel Lino from Gil Vicente. And I'm like, huh, okay, I wonder what he's going to do. The thing is, bro, his starting position is winger. You know, so I was, I was interested to see what he was going to bring to the table. I thought he's going to be purely an offensive component for us. We immediately loan him out to Valencia last year. Don't even give him a shot. So I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. Ends up playing pretty well for Valencia in the minutes that he does get. And immediately from the start of this season, Simeone has full trust in him. But we put him in a left wing back position, kind of a hybrid role for him. But it ends up being the exact position that he needed to be in because he's so dynamic when he has a lot of space in front of him. But he has the technicality to kind of operate in tight spaces as well. And then, of course, he's able to couple all of that offensive mindedness with really good tracking back and Low key, he's actually a really good defender, even though, you know, his natural position is purely offensive. So it's what I've been saying. It's why Joao Felix didn't work. If you buy in Mm. to Diego Simeone, then 
you will work yeah, out good at the club. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, I think the reason that he stood out to me so much in this crazy run, putting up some crazy assist mm-hmm. numbers, and every time that he does get that start playing so well is because you're right, man. When you think about that gap that happened, like that three, four-year gap between Atletico having peak Felipe Luis, yeah. peak Juan Fran, really showcasing the importance that fullbacks play specifically in Diego Simeone's system. I never really realized it until these past few years when I thought about the defenders that try to replace those guys, like a Renan Lodi, for example. Yeah. Never really saw that sort of impact ever again until a guy like Samuel Lino arrives this season. And he's been part of, you know, like I mentioned, I've been watching Atletico for some reason these past two weeks a lot. And every time that I watch him, he is a prominent part of both the defense, but also the offensive creation and the opportunities that he provides through his really accurate, really smart crosses. I love him, dude. I love him. And it feels like finally Simeone got one right with like his defensive transfers that, that he's been trying to seek out ever since he lost like that golden generation of like Juan Fran, Felipe Luis, and then Godin, uh, Godin as yeah. well at the back. And this one feels very sure. It feels really good. Yes. Only 23 only twenty three years old. So I hope he can continue like playing at this level and it isn't just like a really hot month that he's having in that Atleti jersey. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely. The thing is, I do think that he's going to continue this level because he really does look so comfortable. Lothi would do this, but he would only do it like once every three mm-hmm. months. And that's what always frustrated me about him because I could see the potential. But he just could not do it on a consistent basis. But right now, Lino's like on an eight-game streak where he's just playing at a very high level. So that immediately tells me that he's a class above a player like Lodi. Yeah, yeah this, was, this was actually the first Atleti game that I missed in like the last uh, like okay, two weeks. Yeah. So I saw the highlights. The way this game started was wild. <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah, immediately <laughs> off the bat, Hermoso scores an own goal, and I'm just like, again, man? Again, Shit. Yeah. 30, 40 seconds in, and it's a wacky own goal, yeah. one that should not hit the back of the net. And I really, I could just imagine your reaction at that oh, moment. Dude. I was like, I hope Salter was all right. <laughs> Thankfully, it got pulled back thanks to VAR. Yeah, he yeah. was clearly offside. Clearly. So, yeah, just a funny representation of like what Atleti is capable of. They can go through a crazy comeback right now or defeat a really feisty opponent but they can also like you know play some really wacky confusing football at times that has other teams get involved such as with Feyenoord and with Sociedad keeping it close the whole match oh yeah the way Atletico are playing this season does lend itself to kind of chaos especially in this game this was definitely a more exaggerated version of how we've been playing but we're going to see this basically weekly if you're watching Atletico games we sit so deep we invite a lot of pressure and it's something we've been doing for the last 10 years the thing is we're almost double downing doubling down on that fact that we're just going to soak up a lot of pressure the reason why it works is because we you know we do have good defenders whether it's Savic maybe Witzel and then we have good commitment from players like Lino and Llorente and then on top of that we have players like Antoine Griezmann who can relieve a lot of pressure but it's only because he's world class truly if we did not have Antoine Griezmann we would not be getting any of these results. Even if he doesn't score or assist, the impact that he has on the pitch for us when it comes to that relief of pressure, it's it's invaluable. Like it's literally irreplaceable. But that's the thing, man. Like there was a time the Sociedad that had 75% possession. 75%. It's gonna be like that. The problem is, you know, we don't have world-class defenders like we used to anymore. So we are going to concede no matter how well we play. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I don't consider Atletico to be an elite team. We're missing uh, some very key components when it comes to being that team, that what team that we used to be. You know, because back then we had, first off, an elite defense, but then we had prime Griezmann, prime Diego Costa, you know, Kevin Gamero, Yannick Ferreira Carrasco in his prime. So not only did we have a really good back line, we had elite offensive players to occupy our opponent. And, you know, we were beating Bayern Munich, Madrid, yes. Barcelona. Yes. That's the type of level that we were at. Now we're definitely underneath that, but we're definitely on the rise. We're just we're just missing players to actually get us into that upper echelon of top European football. Yeah, yeah, I think there's no arguing that right now with what uh, Simeone has tried to form with his back line. I actually saw a tweet today where I kind of want to get your thoughts on it, whether you agree or disagree regarding this this topic that we're talking about right now. Raj Chohan says on Twitter, he said this, Diego Simeone would sacrifice a limb for Man City's back four today. Gavardiol, 
Ake Diaz Walker is the closest level of pure defending there has been to Felipe Luis, Godin, Jimenez, and Juan Fran. Yeah, that's yeah. literally what we're saying is we have good players at the back right now, but it is just nowhere near oh, the eliteness that we once had. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But the tactics of Simeone are so well thought out yeah. that he's not going to change that. And I'm okay with that because we have players like Antoine Griezmann, because we have players like Koke and Alvaro Morata. I'm completely fine with this very defensive approach just with lesser players. Dude, I just, I just wish the board would support Simeone financially, bro. Because <laughs> yeah. you look at the transfers, Aspilicueta and Sayunchu were the guys that he were, was able to get defensively this yeah. past cha- transfer window. That's so... Bro, you're asking Simeone to do so much Mm -hmm. with those resources he needs to get more help from the board beyond like those expensive offensive signings for example joao felix i would love to see y'all get like a like a couple of big defensive signings 40 50 million dollar range to really just solidify the next 10 years of your defensive future and i've kind of mentioned this before i think the reason why the scouting team and the board maybe aren't going for big name players right now for the last couple years is because we had a string of really bad signings. We really tried to go for potential. That's what Atletico is all about. Always. Getting players who are either really unknown or very young and hoping that within three and four years in the Atleti system, they pop off. And, you know, if we want to stick in that back line, I'm talking very specifically about players like Mario Hermoso and the uh, Portuguese yeah. from Porto, Felipe, right? Yeah. We got those two guys. Hermoso, I think, I believe came from Espanol, and we, he had a really good season the year prior before we got him. So when we got Hermoso, we were like, okay, he's going to be like Jose Jimenez. You know, he's young, but within a couple of years, he's going to pop off. Hermoso, I think, has reached his peak. He's not going to get any better, and that's the thing. He's mistake-prone. That's yeah, his dude. best. He's, he has some loose screws, Hermoso. L- loose, bro. bro. And Felipe, he's not at the club anymore. Like, it, it didn't work <laughs> out. Condogbia was, uh, was another guy you tried to do that with, no? Yeah, yeah. We tried to yeah. get him as a defensive midfielder, try and play ah. in center back at times. And now we have Axel Witzel exactly, converted yeah. to a center back. Like, we have a, we've had a string of really poor signings where at the time when the signings were made, they looked good. Good, but they just didn't pan out. And I'll double down on it again. Renan Lodi is another one. Lodi was supposed to be the heir apparent to Felipe Luis, and it literally did not work out. He ended up being a very poor signing as far as what we expect at Atletico. So, dude, we really it's just it's bad signing this, after yes. bad signing after bad signing. Yes. So now we have to go through this period where we just have to make whatever we have work. This helps me perfectly transition into my next point because I would like to talk about two elite teams teams that are stout that are figured out that are seeing results from the transfers that they got this past summer window and those two teams are arsenal and manchester city facing off in one of the biggest games in the premier league this season so far with two potential title contenders going head to head at the emirates stadium and dude what a result what a atmosphere arsenal has come out on top versus Manchester City for the first time truly. I know they did it in the Community Shield, but truly in a what is a meaningful game in the race for the title. Arsenal has defeated Manchester City. Has Arsenal officially overcome that mental dominance that Manchester City has had over them for so long? Or was this just a case of Manchester City missing some key players and guys like Rodri, guys like De Bruyne, that ultimately led to them losing away from home in a match that in some ways, felt like they were okay losing. I believe Manchester City was the last team that Arteta had not beaten in the Premier League. And I'm going to I'm gonna go with you here. I do think this was breaking that inferiority complex that they had underneath Manchester City, bro. Even though it was a little ugly, they got the goal. Yeah. They got it. And along with that goal comes three points and a defeat over Manchester City. This was massive for Arsenal. I think mainly from a mental perspective because now that they now they know they just beat their rivals last year that beat them and they can beat anybody in the league now so really there's no excuse of oh do arsenal have the right players yeah. do they have you know the right tactics behind the manager of arteta no longer are those questions no longer can those questions be asked it can happen so now it's just up to arsenal to actually go on and win the league themselves yeah, dude massive 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 result if you're a gunner fan you're definitely feeling yourself after this one I just, 
I definitely understand that point. I definitely see it. And I do want to highlight that because Arsenal fans deserve to have this moment. You finally did it. This is a big, big result you needed Huge. in contention for a title race, especially against Manchester City. To be able to beat them like this and just, you know, shut them out, get a clean sheet in the process is huge. On the other side, I feel like De Bruyne wouldn't let this happen, bro. Yeah. I yeah. feel like he wouldn't let this happen. This wouldn't slide on his radar, bro. <laughs> because I've seen him time and time again in these top six, top four matchups that Manchester City gets year in, year out. That's when De Bruyne shows up. That's when he just shows that he's a class above every single other player on the pitch. And he has an impact. And it's just showcased why he's one of the greatest midfielders in Premier League history. That, along with the fact that Rodri has been such a huge, important part of Manchester City's success ever since he joined. And the fact that in the last five games, Manchester City has lost two games. And two of those losses came when Rodri didn't play. He is that important, that clinical for the team. And they are, in a way, almost a little bit lost when he isn't in that midfield, oh, defending yeah. and slinging passes out wide so that he can really set up his wingers for success. So a part of me does think that this win came with a little bit of a caveat. But regardless, it's a win that was needed, and I will give them credit for that. Yeah, I can't argue against that. Rodri has become just as impactful offensively as Gundogan was last year, but he has that defensiveness to him that is truly irreplaceable for Manchester City. You miss that when you don't have Rodri, truly. Rico Lewis can do as much as he can offensively, but there's some sort of defensive grit that I don't think he quite has, and I think you, you lose a little bit of that. Either way, though, this, this game was incredibly tight. I think Gary Neville put it perfectly. It was like a boxing match where the ref is just constantly trying to separate the two boxers, mm-hmm. trying to let them play. Um, this was a really interesting game, and I think credit mainly goes to Arsenal's defense. Gabriel and Saliba, I thought, were fantastic. Declan yes. Rice was phenomenal in that midfield from a ball retrieval perspective. I think that's what really won them this game. A little bit of fortune at the very end with a deflection going into goal, go, <laughs> knocking off of Ake's face. <laughs> what face, a bro. weird goal. Brutal. brutal, man. Brutal if you're Nathan Ake, man. So unlucky. But yeah, I think Arsenal just rode that wave of luck today and they definitely got it, especially when you consider the absences of a player like Rodri and Kevin De Bruyne. And that's what's interesting about this match specifically because it really wasn't what happened in the game for me it's the repercut the repercussions afterwards man because what's that dude all of the pundits every like european podcast right now everyone's saying arsenal's winning the yep, league yep. everybody that's how it goes around like, these like come parts, on bro. man that's how it it's goes it's one game city's two points behind yes bro they're right there and likewise i'm seeing city fans losing their minds <laughs> talking about yeah. this ain't the same team we used to have <laughs> i'm like bro <laughs> we're nine games into the season relax yeah, relax apparently i think the last time city lost two games in a row like this where they lost against wolves and they lost against arsenal this past week the last time they were in the same situation, they went on to win 18 of the next 19 games. Bro, relax. And even us, we predicted that they would go on to win the Premier League. I'm perfectly calm right now, yeah, brother. Yeah, I haven't changed my mind whatsoever. Yeah, it's not changing. But still, I just think it's funny how reactive the Premier League and English fans can be at times, dude. Dude, oh my God. I always forget how reactive they truly can be. I get it. We already said why this result was so big for Arsenal. But remember last year when Manchester City had a weird first three months yes. in September, October, and November. And then they turned it on from December all the way to June. Yeah. So let's uh, let's be careful here until it's like February. Yeah, if, they're, if they're like eight points off and it, uh, ten points off and it's March, then okay, yeah, maybe Manchester City have a really bad string of results. But for me, it's just way, way too early. Way too early. And, and more so... The Premier League is so stacked this year, bro. Dude, I love it. The top six it. are all within four points of each yes. other. Ridiculous, yes. bro. One of the craziest starts to the Prem I think we've ever seen. Yeah, because there's there's genuine competition now. What yeah. was such a Manchester City-Liverpool type of duel for so many years, and then last year, Manchester City-Arsenal. This year, dude, I mean, we're talking about Arsenal winning the league, but... They're in second place because in first place is Tottenham, Tottenham huh? on goal difference. We have Arsenal in second. We have City in third, Liverpool in fourth. And right behind them, we still have Aston Villa. We have Brighton. It's so, so close. But these teams, there's a genuine, gen- genuine threat that they pose, which just kind of reminds me about what was your take before the season started that you, you believed a lot of these teams outside of City were a year off. Mm-hmm. Do you still see that being the, the issue here between them and contending for a title? Or does it seem like the timeline these teams are in has actually advanced a bit more than what you thought? 
I, I still think the teams that are in contention for the title now can be much better. So we can get into detail later, but for example, Liverpool-Brighton, right? 2-2, I think a fully realized Liverpool wins that yeah. game. I really and we do. have in the past when we've gotten over 90 points. Like, exactly. It was a frustration that we tied that yeah. game this past week. Villa also tied this week. I still think mm-hmm. they can play better. And so that's why I, I'll still stand by it. I do think a lot of these teams can actually reach a higher peak. And that's what's even crazier because that the Premier League is on a trajectory to be a, an insane league. And already right now, even with these teams who have a lot of new players, they're still able to compete. That's just the brilliance of this fucking league, bro. It's beautiful. Reports are coming in in the Premier League that Luton has gotten another loss this time against 10-man Spurs. Just updating the Give and Go listeners as well as yourself because we did say that they would not win over three games this entire season. You playfully said that they wouldn't win a single game. Unfortunately, (laughs) that storyline is over. It's over. It's It's over. over. The dream is done. (laughs) The dream is done. Happy for Luton. Luton will have to get two victories in the next 20-something games. We'll see how that goes. And the last snapshot that I want to highlight in the Premier League is uh, actually Manchester United getting a, a comeback victory through two Scott McTominay goals in the last five, ten minutes, <sighs> bringing them back after being down to Brentford at home. It was going to be a chaotic, a drama-filled ending, but the Scottish man saved them alongside Harry Maguire, getting an assist on that second goal. Yeah, honestly, crazy scenes at Old Trafford. I... I <laughs> I don't want to be too harsh. I think the first goal was really good. Second goal, I think, was just a little, it was just chaos. Mm-hmm. Pure, mm-hmm. pure chaos. If you're a Brentford man, I would be so pissed. Oh, I'd dude. be so, so pissed that you ended up losing this in the last four minutes. But, dude, We've come. We've been seeing that a lot lately yeah. in football, bro. Yeah, We've dude, seen like, a lot. Feyenoord, we saw it with Union Berlin, Champions League. Yeah. It doesn't stop with these lesser teams fucking shooting themselves in their own foot. Yeah, like. I don't honestly. I don't know if Brentford could have avoided this because both of both of McTominay's goals came off of weird ricochets, weird fumbles in the box, and he was good enough and quick enough to actually just see the opportunity and get a shot in or a header. So it's, yeah. the credit goes all to Scott McTominay sure. here, but it's just pure chaos. There's like I, I don't know if Brentford could have done anything. Like Absolutely. just gotta get bigger, get get on the ball, and not let United get it. That's all you can do, but. It, for me, it really was just a very fortunate win, but completely deserved because McTominay decided, hey, I'm taking this. Yes. And that kind of brings up an interesting question. Uh, I've seen McTominay score some pretty impressive goals in his career, right? He was labeled as a midfielder throughout all of his career. He's been playing as a midfielder for Manchester United, but I saw some people on Twitter post, whoever decided Scott McTominay was a midfielder while he was going to like the youth ranks fucked up because at times he shows some really good composure especially in that first goal the first touch he had the first touch and then the finish and then he's had some beautiful out of the box finishes as as well and then the ability to head the ball his frame he's tall he's strong is there an argument to be made that scott mctominay should actually be like a striker dude dude honestly he, he 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 resembles that of like an old traditional number nine where he's just kind of slow, but he's got that huge, stocky, physical build. And I mean, with goals like this, he proves that he also has the ability in the box to get some really nice touches in and then the finish to boot. So it is really interesting. Like, I wonder if, I wonder if Ten Hag is going to use McTominay as like a super sub to just come on and get himself in the box yeah. at the end of every game yeah. if they need a goal. Honestly, yeah. it wouldn't be a bad I think, idea. I think so, man. I think they should try to give him a more forward role instead of the opposite where he tries to play as a defensive midfielder at times give him that opportunity to just kind of roam up top and see if he can do what he did against Brentford again over in La Liga with the Giants and both Real Madrid and Barcelona Barcelona today tied against Granada 2-2 that's actually a pretty important result in this title race so yeah. far uh, and just like we saw Premier League fans you know start to lose their minds after Arsenal won and Manchester City lost I'm already seeing Barca fans being three points behind from first place but being in third place saying is there any way we can bounce back from this? You know, I'm telling you, calm down, relax yourselves. I think you're still in championship contention. Yeah. But this does this does have a little bit of an impact. Something to take away from it, something that is worth noting, is that a La Liga 93-year-old record has been broken yes. with La Mina Mall becoming the youngest goal scorer of all time in Spain's top division. 16 years and 87 days old, bro. Not even close to being 17. He just turned just 16. Just turned 16. 
Insane, bro. The dude's an embryo. Wow. <laughs> 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 nice little tap in for Yamal, but yeah, be complete. Yeah, 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 straight yeah, tap in. Straight right? tap in, but I mean, hey, it, a goal is a goal. Crazy that he's 16, bro. Yeah. Imagine scoring in La Liga for one of the biggest clubs in the world and you're a sophomore in high school. Insane, dude. Crazy, Insane. And I think bro. about that too, about like the pressure that's put on him before he did that. <sighs> It, it helps to get a goal like this, you know? To yeah. just have that on your resume. Get on the board, man. Exactly. It just it just adds more to your just overall confidence. And I think we've been seeing that from him every single week, ever since we brought him up like two months ago when we started popping off. La Mina Mall so far has risen up to the occasion. Yeah. And I'm interested to see if he can keep it going or if at some point, you know, he starts to kind of plateau a little bit just because he's so young. Yeah, I think that's inevitable. There's go- there's going to be moments where he's just, you know, not as effective, but he's still an incredible talent. He has so much room to grow. And if this is his starting point, bro, I, I honestly don't know where he could end yeah. up. Like, we could be talking like the Jude Bellingham, but winger version. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's where Yamal really could end up. But on the other side for Granada, man, I want to highlight Brian Saragossa with one of the dirtiest goals I've seen this weekend, bro. Holy shit. That second one for me specifically, he just turned Barcelona's defense inside out, dropped two Barca players, and then rifles it past Ter Stegen. Dirty, dirty goal from Saragossa, bro. Oh, my God. He was on a weird mission today, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was trying to prove a point or some shit, I don't know what happened with him between him and Barcelona's past, bro, but he was (laughs) fucking trying to acknowledge some shit, dude. And he fucking went off, dude. He went off. He had them up 2-0, 2 yeah, two 0 Yeah, two 0 at one point, and Barcelona had to come back and crawl back into the game. So, props to them. I just wish they could have closed the deal out once again, bro. Because, like we mentioned earlier, a lesser team loses a lead. Yeah, and it keeps happening for for Barcelona. They should have beaten Granada, and I'm not surprised that they came back against Granada. But this this is happening for Barcelona a lot this season, where they will just have a spell of 30, 40 minutes where. They can't figure it out. They don't yep. do anything. They don't have bite, any any offensive threat. But they always figure it out within the 90 minutes. So they, I always can back them to either get a good draw or just a good result against teams that are lesser than them. For example, in this game against Granada. But this is why I don't see Barcelona as an elite team yet. Because I, I, I think what they really, really lack is... Just true composure. And maybe you get that from like a star player, but when you look at the players that they have, mm. they're so young, man. This is truly a such a young team. And I think they're just missing that like one captain. That one guy who'll just like completely take over, guide everybody. Maybe Frankie Dion can become that. Absolutely. I think he's definitely on that trajectory. And especially with the class and talent that he has on the ball, he's such an an excellent midfielder. But right now, I just don't see a true leader that Barcelona have right now. But there's so much talent in this yeah. team, bro. There's so much 100%. talent. 100%. That, that is why, when we made our uh, preseason predictions, that is why I went with Real Madrid winning the title this year because I just remember last year, Barcelona had so many games where they relied on their defense to win the mm-hmm. matches. Offensively, they never really had that fluidity yeah. that I see Real Madrid have. And it's almost the exact same opposite problem with Real Madrid. Their defense can be open at times. But this year, we are seeing moments where they kind of stagnate. And, you know, they are ultimately relying on a 16-year-old winger to kind of pull them out of these matches. Mm-hmm. Or they're relying on a Leva to just show his genius. Genius. Or then, lone lone Joao Felix, yes. like to like pop off. Yes, for them. they're Fer- relying on a lot of exactly. different different avenues here. It's Fermin weird. Lopez, they've been relying on him to kind of have a little bit of an ascension as well. It's all good. They're all very talented, but. In the title race, I do think I'm still sticking to Real Madrid ultimately winning it because I see them having a little bit more formidability ultimately in those offensive fronts that I just don't see Barcelona having. And I think just how I've seen Barcelona start the season off so far in La Liga, there are just moments of concern that I think ultimately will will hurt them in this title race. On the other side, Real Madrid, I mean, the only thing I want to highlight is Bellingham getting a brace, now has 10 goals in La Liga. 10 goals leading the league so far as a midfielder matching Ronaldo's start uh once he joined Real Madrid yes as well yes. 10 goals in like his first I don't know what seven games eight, or some bullshit games, ridiculous man Lit- he's literally doing Cristiano Ronaldo numbers literally like there's there's no exaggeration <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, here, man yeah I know like we're not exaggerating like he's matching it it's weird bro it's because crazy. I feel like we, we we didn't have a podcast back in those days right so we weren't able to you know highlight our reactions to Cristiano Ronaldo doing crazy shit for Real Madrid once he put on that jersey but I mean numbers wise we have a chance to do it right now because Jude <laughs> Bellingham is matching those numbers that's how good he's been it's ridiculous he truly is on a trajectory of 
potentially becoming one of the greatest midfielders of all time. My only thing with Jude is that I do think he misses a certain a certain aspect in his game that I think he needs to earn or gain in this upcoming year with Real Madrid that I hope he is able to, you know, maybe get from his teammates. Did you hear anything about Jude Bellingham and a couple of remarks that were made between him, Vinny Jr., and Camavinga? No, what happened? All right, producer, Rudd, if you could pull up this photo. It's an Instagram screen grab here. So as we know, Vinny Jr. loves to dance. Absolutely. He's got that Brazilian samba in mm. him, bro, and he's embodied it ever since he arrived at Real Madrid, even back when he was in Brazil. He's always had it. But Camavinga has jumped on board lately, and uh, if you watch these games, bro, he is celebrating with Vinny now in dancing fashion. It's a beautiful thing to see. But uh, Jude Belling has had something to say about it <laughs> on Instagram. If you can take a look right here, Jude Bellingham says... <laughs> Two shit dancers. Damn. Then he tags Kamavinga. Kamavinga responds and says, Next time you have to show the world your dancing talent. And then Trump Mini chimes in. Chimes in. <laughs> and he says he can't. <laughs> he just says he can't, bro. Doesn't even give him a shot. <laughs> and then Jude Bellingham says, Okay, it's time. So this is a fun little narrative to look forward to now because the next time Bellingham scores, Will he dance? That's dope. It's going to be weird, bro, because I don't think I can... I don't know if I've seen him ever move like that. A little but. tall, a little lanky, but maybe he's got something. Maybe. Maybe he's maybe. got something. I think Dan Byrne uh, showed the CBS crew that he could dance, bro. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't be surprised if Bellingham pulls out something. It's crazy, dude, but when you think about the players that can dance on this team, this is one of the most like uh, rhythm-filled squads in Europe right now, or at least in the elite teams. Like, Real Madrid has so many guys that are unafraid to dance, dude. <laughs> is there a certain dancer that stands out to you in the past in footballing lore? Is there any player that stands out to you that dance? I mean, Ronaldinho has to be one of the most like famous ones Paqueta has always done really good dance moves but for me the first thing that comes to mind is the Colombian national team in 2014 oh, bro yeah. they really showed me that I was like yeah. damn bro some football has got some moves bro <laughs> holy shit so that, that was my like Cuadrado uh, Juan Camilo Zuniga like yes. all those players man every time they scored a goal James would get involved sometimes yes. not, maybe not as smooth but those players those Colombian players man really showed me that you know some football has got some hella moves dude damn dude that might be the perfect dancer because all i can think yeah. about is brazilians right now yeah but if you think outside of brazil who stands out colombia was just full they had that fullback the small little short fullback who was that yeah was that, Sun- that was him yeah oh, or there's, there's, there was another there's one another too one, no? there's two of them dude, they had two just, they had two really good dude, fullbacks I, dude, for man. real yeah, dude, yeah. straight out of the dance studio fucking <laughs> playing amazing games but then also <laughs> dancing so well keep an eye out for it man i want to see billingham dance over in city a uh, result that stood out to me was a result that stood out to the whole footballing world which was AC Milan's victory over Genoa 1-0 through a Christian Pulisic game winner, bro. Let's go, baby. I it's, heard. I didn't see it, but I, I heard about this fair, whole crazy thing. Fair. Now, Yunus Musa getting the assist, 85th minute goal away from home. Incredible scenes, dude. Incredible scenes. I think Pulisic already has, like, what, three or four goals with oh, AC Milan yeah. so far? And some big ones, though. Yes, They're, like, big really ones. big goals. Absolutely. Really, like, finding his role in that front three with uh, Giroud and Leao, yeah. which is amazing to see, man. A yeah. CONCACAF player actually, like, find his footing really nice. And then Yunus Musa as well in the midfield playing beautifully. But what I love so much about this, especially when a CONCACAF player thrives in Europe, this can go for a Mexican, for an American, or even a Canadian. Costa Rican. Costa Rican. Is, okay, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> is, I love seeing the reaction that the people native to the country that they play in have to seeing them succeed. Like, you know, I love seeing all these English people react to Chicharito going off for them, right? Yeah. That was a nice thing. It was nice. Hearing the British just say the word Chicharito was so fun. It's cool. And likewise, now we're seeing it with Christian Pulisic over in, Itali- over in Italy. We're seeing these Italians really embrace him and welcome him, especially since he's balling out for this for his, for his their club. Wow. And so there's a video going around of an Italian. Think of, the, think of it like as the, the Italian give and go. Right. Okay. We were Italian. We had our own show. We had a budget. And we were <laughs> hired. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a show out there that records their reactions to live AC Milan games. Okay. I assume they must have AC Milan fans or they must be AC Milan fans themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look at the reaction, the in studio reaction to Christian Pulisic scoring this game winner. <laughs> I guess the other guy was talking shit. Do 
you with him. Yoke <laughs> guy's not saying a word, but he's saying a lot. <laughs> Bully, 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 saving ac milan and getting the fucking result first off what's your reaction to just seeing that i really wish that americans had the same love for christian because mm. it's nothing but criticism when it comes mm. to pulisic from an american perspective uh unless you know, you know unless you watch You're the right. give and go and you listen to my fucking takes because i've consider pulisic to be the best american player for the last six years uh but uh, the thing is, he's this good. You're right, though. That, he, that is sad. It's like, sad. It's, it's, it's sad because even Mexico so appreciated Chicharito. Yeah. But USA doesn't appreciate their stars. No, bro. Footballing they, stars. They don't appreciate them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They consider Pulisic to be a guy who consistently fails in Europe. Mm -hmm. it's super annoying to see because, you know, he went to Dortmund, went to Chelsea, and they don't really consider them to have had success there, even though, in my opinion, I really do think he did. And now he's going off at Milan, something that I knew he could easily do. And so I, I hope, the thing is, though, I hope that this season here in That'd Italy, nice. I hope that that changes because it definitely should be changing. So that, that's the first thing that comes to my mind is because what a beautiful reaction, man. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, he's this good. He's saving Milan. He's scoring winners, bangers. And that's Christian Pulisic, baby. If you want to talk about saving Milan, then let's talk about Mike Magnon getting a red card. AC Milan had already made all their subs in, their, in the game, so they had to pick an on-field player. <laughs> and it was just one of those rare moments where you see a striker, a defender, a midfielder yeah. have to wear the goalkeeper's jersey and get in goal. And who was it for AC Milan but none other than Olivier Giroud? Tall who, frame. Tall frame, who went back there, got back in the net, and defended his team for a good 10 solid minutes in this match, Crazy. played his heart out, and at one point actually had a genuine goalkeeping save to keep AC Milan in this match and allow them to get all three points away from home. Insane. I've rewatched the Giroud highlight where he just kind of punches the ball out as it's coming close to him. He had to like rush out real quick. It takes good goalkeeping IQ to do that. Mm. He understood the timing of the situation, he understood the pressure that was coming. He sacrificed his body, punches the ball out, saves his team. It's one of my favorite things in football, one of my favorite rare occurrences in football when you get to see an outfield player become a goalkeeper. Dude, it's super rare because usually, even when it does happen, it's like for a minute. Yes. You know, it's for a very, very short time. So it's crazy that you did even pulled off like more than five minutes. It's nuts. It's nuts. It's nuts. Like apparently like AC Milan is actually, they're like jumping on this train. Of, yeah, like, you yeah, know, they like, have to. The pictures of it are so wild. They're actually like selling a exclusive Olivier Giroud goalkeeper's jersey right now on this story, <laughs> dude. It's crazy. And then like ESPN was like posting like percentages like save percentage stats online. They compare like Onana, like uh, Donnarumma, and then at the very top, Giroud at 100%, Hell bro. Yeah. He put in a performance. It was just crazy to see because I've thought about like that one time that Harry Kane had to get in goal and he had a complete blunder and allowed a shot to go past him after it just kind of like skidded off of his hands. Yeah. This was a good representation here of an outfield player having a really solid performance as a goalkeeper and it's going to go down in footballing lore, man. God, it must be so fun though because there's zero pressure for you to succeed but if you do succeed you become oh, a hero man. hero bro a hero they were damn near just fucking tossing it <laughs> up and down bro that's what it felt like the energy was so fucking nice and we can see the reaction of the italian show uh to what they what they said when they saw Giroud pull off those crazy saves Olivier. <laughs> Grande portero. Oliviero è un grande portiero. Ragazzi, ma non lo sapete voi che si allenano ogni tanto lui per portiero? È un grande portiero. It's talking shit. They won't, they won't celebrate yeah, with him. They won't do it. They hate this shit. Giroud. 
ucciderlo è finita vinciamo noi 1 0 Pulisic la decide la decide anche Olivier the way he lurks over there this show looks good man I'd watch this shit this would be so fun lo fichamos That's beautiful. Fichamos. They, they, they signed him. And they're talking about Pulisic there, man. It's beautiful to see. Yeah. Inter Miami, officially out of the MLS playoff race after losing 1-0 yeah. to Cincinnati. Yeah. We talked about the possibility of this, whether they will be able to do it or not. The dream is dead. It's the dead, dream yeah. is gone. Messi was not able to ultimately guide this team due to injury. They look terrible without him ultimately these yeah. past two weeks. Oh, yeah. Dude. And Inter Miami is out. I guess the motive now is just looking forward towards next season and really, really settling in and managing Messi's minutes in terms of health and keeping him from getting injured, but also maybe bettering up the squad a little bit more so that if he does get injured, they can rely on themselves to get a result. Bro, what is Messi going to do? This will be the longest break he's ever had in his career. When, when does the MLS start back it up again? It starts in March. Bro. Yeah. And since they're already Ooh, out, they theoretically just playing for like a half, you know, for the rest of the season. So he could already start thinking about his vacation plans, which will last like six months, bro. Uh, if preseason probably starts like in February, even then, he gets like four or five months just off. I love that, Loki. It's, it's great. No, it, cause, uh, it, great. no, it's perfect for Messi in his career right now because he needs like to be healthy. Yeah. If you're an if you're an Argentine fan, it's even better because when you, those qualifiers do come up, like Messi's going to be fresh in the spring dude like completely fresh this is gonna be weird honestly i don't i don't know if messi's gonna be okay with this yeah like, yeah so dude, he, has, he has he's probably hasn't had a break like this since he was like eight years old dude like his internal <laughs> clock is gonna be off like, yeah it's gonna be december he's like i should be putting in minutes somewhere yeah bro. man and so he's in argentina celebrating the one year anniversary is some bullshit he's gonna like find an amateur league to play in <laughs> he's like i need it i need football <laughs> i just uh, yeah that is curious i know that he's already going straight into international duty so he'll definitely be getting his minutes with the national team when they but, need him yeah. but even then they're building up towards Copa America he'll be playing some World Cup qualifier games for sure but yeah he's gonna be free man a Nuts. free man truly and he can do whatever he'd like I would love to see him make appearances you know like at Barca games maybe just be in the stands fine, yeah. go over to Europe go to South America catch a couple of matches there I just want to see him feel comfortable bro and just really have fun do a couple of interviews and just really relax himself in the in the build up to what is going to be a grueling MLS season in which he will have the opportunity to guide Inter, Inter Miami to a title. Last topic, bro. I've been having people DM me. They want to get my reaction. Chaos in Guadalajara. Oh, yeah. Trouble in paradise. Mm -hmm. Chivas is in the headlines right now because of a uh, certain uh, Alexis Vega and Chicote Calderon, as well as like a youth academy player or some bullshit too, getting involved, getting a little carried away with their uh, senses here bringing girls back to the hotel and breaking Chivas regulation, essentially. Yeah. So this following what's already been a chaotic and dramatic past few months for Alexis Vega specifically. At one point, he whipped his ass out live in the middle of a match against Atlas and as part of a celebration. El Nalgón was his nickname. It was given to him after that moment. Alexis Vega has always been a very, very uh, fascinating character in Chivas's. uh overall build and Chicote Calderon somehow got pulled into this shit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So the club has decided that these actions were too much to forgive and Alexis Vega and Chicote Calderon will be set to leave the club permanently. While all of this was happening, Baunovic was on the coaching carousel where Spanish side Almeria was looking to get a coach and they were looking at Baunovic to be the replacement. He ultimately waved them off and said, no, thank you. I'm going to stick to this Chivas project. And Banovic will see out this season with Chivas. Following all of that happening this week, Chivas ends up getting a 4-1 victory against Atlas this past weekend without guys like Alexis, Vegas or like Alexis Vega or Chicote Calderon. And so, in a way, it's the start of a new era, but also a really interesting situation that's being presented to me, bro, because... My biggest takeaway to all of this, you know, it's been dramatic, it's been a lot of headlines, it's been ugly, honestly, is that the fact that Chivas as a club is capable of having this happen to them, yeah. knowing the players that we have at hand and knowing the club overall, 
It's why I felt that loss against Tigres in the final 10 times over. Because losing when you're up 2-0 in a final, losing that lead and losing the opportunity to lift silverware, it's so tough to get that back, especially if your club isn't really a well-ran club. Yeah. And Chivas is a team that just struggles with consistency in terms of getting good, good results in the standings, but then also just all the internal shit, like what we're seeing this week. So it was because of that that I felt that loss so heavily, man, because I was like, this was our chance. I don't think we're the type of team that's going to make another title run and be back in that final setting six months after it happened. We're just not that type of team, not like a Tigres or a Monterrey or even America, perhaps. For Chivas, it was kind of a bit of, of a do or die situation. And so I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that any of this is happening. I think there's internal things that need to be fixed whether it's with the board whether it's with the owners whoever it might be the fact that this was allowed to go on for so long and then ultimately saw itself build up and climax into this crazy week that we just experienced tells me that we just aren't a well-rounded club overall in mexico's grand scope we need to fix things up and hopefully this can be like a lesson learned for the team for the players, and for Chivas overall to just change things up so that we can get back on a winning course because we did start the season off well with like three or four straight wins. The League's Cup happened, and we have not won since until this past weekend against Atlas. Hopefully, we can kind of turn our luck around here, but if we want any chance of doing something notable, we got to fix the internal things, and hopefully Chivas can approach it correctly. Yeah, I mean, that is the exact reason why I'm really surprised Banovic didn't decide to go to Europe and go to Almeria. Not that Almeria are, you know, necessarily a really good team in Spain, but they have some good players, some decent prospects. But, you know, more importantly, you're in a European system and you can try and, like, be successful there. If you do decently at Almeria, then maybe you go to, like, a team like Valencia or something like that, you know, a mid-table team. So that's... I'm really surprised at that, that he would already see the chaos that's happening at Chivas and be like, ah, I'll stay. Yeah. But I'm really surprised by that. Um, Maybe you just really like Guadalajara, man. Maybe. You know, 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 Mexicans do appreciate that. It's a great city. They appreciate someone like that that's loyal to the club and that's, you know, an extranjero but comes in and really takes in the culture, takes in the kid. That's what it feels like he's done. And so maybe he just felt that he wouldn't have that same reception with Almeria. I I guess guess, so, yeah. But you are right in the sense that timing-wise... If he was looking for a way out, I mean, this yeah, was it, bro. This was it. He did yeah. the most he could. I, in my opinion, I think he peaked with Chivas going on that crazy Ligia run last season. You know, he doesn't really owe us much now. And given that we were already on like a four or five game losing streak, it just felt fitting that he could, you know, seek a different avenue or seek a different journey in the footballing world. So I agree. I'm surprised, bro, that he stayed, but I, thankful. I wonder where Vega is going to go to. Like, what, what's going to, is he going to, like, try and force, like, a move that he really wants? Or is he going to be, like, open to kind of anything? Because I feel like having a fallout with your club can put you in a weird spot mentally. Or yeah. cause it may, maybe cause you could use it as a positive to be like, you know, fuck Chivas. I'm going to go off for our rival. I mean, you know, maybe he joins that'd Atlas cra- or maybe, crazy. maybe he joins just, like, another bigger team like America yeah. or Cruz Azul or something like that. Or maybe he just says, you know, I'm out of Mexico and tries to maybe goes to the MLS or something like that. Like, I really do wonder what he's going to do, because if he's being forced out, it kind of just really opens it up. But then again, if you're a club buying him, are you put off by what happened? I don't know. Uh, like, there's, there's sure. a lot of interesting factors here now. Yeah. It gets really I, interesting. I, I, I'm disappointed in Vega, bro. I'm disappointed. Yeah. Uh, I really liked him at one point, just even like a year or two ago. Yeah. Playing amazing football for Chivas, being our best player offensively, and having a little bit more of an impetus that most of the Mexican players we had up front at the time didn't really have. I saw Vega with you know, a really powerful shot from outside the box if needed, but also just that IQ. He's a smart player, and he's mm. capable of having some really good, solid moments on the pitch, and we would see that pretty often with Chivas. In the build-up to the World Cup, I was even going so far as saying like he should be part of that front three, especially with the injury to Tecatito Corona. I made an argument that he should be the direct replacement for him mm-hmm. because he does have those attributes and those skills. But then he did get minutes in the World Cup, didn't really shine, didn't really have his moment of brilliance, Uh, whether that was him or, you know, a a situation that had to do with the coaching, who knows, overall, he just didn't, he didn't showcase himself the way I was hoping for, hoping to. 
And then after the tournament, I, we haven't really seen much of Vega ever since then, bro. Yeah. It's been a string of injuries. It's been a string of That's the problem. weird performances with Chivas. He's just been kind of in and out of the team. And now the way he's being presented in the transfer market is much different because I thought at one point he would be one of those Mexicans capable of going over to Europe and potentially, th and potentially thriving. But the way I'm seeing it now, man... I think he's just going to stay in Mexico. And I could yeah. see a team like Tigres picking him up and just yeah. trying to get the best out of him to it, almost as a fuck you to Chivas. That's how, exactly how I see it. Because he never maintained that form going into the World Cup. And even the form that he found in the Ligia in last semester, he actually found a really good rhythm and was a huge proponent for Chivas offensively. But he got an injury and he's, it just hasn't really been the same for the last like six months, man. So it's just been weird. And so I agree with you. I don't see him making any sort of big moves, to be honest, and just staying in Mexico or pulling up Pulido and going to the MLS or something like that. that honestly, that's just where I see Vega's career going. But I share the same sentiment as you. I'm really disappointed because yeah. I really did think that he could do something at mid-tier Europe. I really did yeah. think he could have, but I just don't see it anymore. And Chicote Calderon, too. Ah, I'm never... <sighs> Chicote took way too long to get good at Guadalajara, yeah, man. Yeah, really inconsistent. It, it took him so long to get a good starting position. And even when he did start playing more, I still thought he was very inconsistent mm -hmm. in his performances. He peaked when he was like 20 years old at Necaxa. Like annoying. for me, it's been really annoying to see Calderon's career because I was such a fan of him when he was with that really good Necaxa team. But for me, he just kind of really hasn't shown up since. So it's not as big a loss, I think, honestly, from like you know that perspective, talent-wise. So any team in Mexico will be happy to have him though, because yeah. you know he knows the league well and he's a decent player. But that's about it. A new era is upon us. In Guadalajara, <laughs> and we'll just have to wait and see how it goes for the rest of this season.